From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 240, recorded on July 26, 2024. Rack and Yellow, and you're listening to the podcast all about parasitism. Parasites or parasitism? I couldn't decide, so I made a hybrid. Parasitism. <laughs> Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon, De Pommier. Hello, Vincent, and everybody else. Um, glad to be here. From Glasgow, Scotland, Christina Naula. Hello, good evening, all. And what's the weather like, Dixon? You really want to know? Oh, I yeah, would I be do. happy to yes. tell you. It's, it's perfect. <laughs> it's low 80s, 40% humidity, a few scattered clouds, uh, no wind, basically. Uh, poor um, Daniel, <laughs> uh, because he, he might be struggling to get his sails filled. Uh, but it's it's one of those days that you wish would happen 100 more times. It's a very nice day. Very nice day. Our guest today from uh, the University of Washington, Sean Murphy. Welcome to TWIP, Sean. Hi, thanks for having me. So what are they like out there? Pretty nice. It's not quite <laughs> as hot as the rest of the country, and uh, it's probably 70 and sunny. And, oh, uh, nice. Perfect. You know, I think the rest of the country gets the wrong idea about Seattle. Yes, it rains in February, but the summer and into the fall is just glorious. Yeah. If you, if you enjoy what we do on these programs, we'd love to have your financial support. Microbe TV is a 501c3 nonprofit, so your donations would be federal U.S. tax deductible. And we do many different science programs besides TWIP. And uh, if you enjoy them, please support us. Microbe.tv slash contribute, different ways that you can help us out. So, Sean, let's start by uh, finding out uh, where you're from and, and a little bit about your education and training. Sure. Well, um, I've been here in Seattle since 2008. I, uh, I'm a, you know, what you would call a physician scientist. And my medical training is in laboratory medicine, or sometimes we call it clinical pathology. And specifically mm -hmm. within there, you know, I've really been interested in medical microbiology. Um, so yeah, so I've been here since 2008. I was a resident and I've gone through the faculty ranks and I'm, and I'm a professor at the University of Washington right now. Oh, congratulations. But, you know, like mm -hmm. I've been interested in microbiology since I was about 17 years old. Um, I went to high school in Iowa and uh, I was interested in more like agronomy meets microbiology. I had some radishes <laughs> and they got some kind of root rot. And then I, <laughs> I, um, I met with, this was in like the very early days of the internet. I got connected to a professor at Cornell in Ithaca mm -hmm. and, um, one time on a visit there, um, when to visit some of my dad's like alma mater friends, uh, I brought some of this fungus with, and this very kind mycologist uh, sat with me for like an hour and a half, and we looked under the scope while my family sweated it out in the summer hallway at Cornell. <laughs> and after that, I was all all microbiology all the way. So when I was in college, I I sort of switched from plant microbiology into animal and then human microbiology. So I went to Iowa State and I worked on uh, uh, equine infectious anemia virus. It's the horse virus related to HIV. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I started working with Joel Bremen, uh, who recently passed away. He's a past president of the American Society of Trauma and Hygiene. And we started working on malaria epidemiology stuff. I went and spent a summer in college uh, at the NIH in 1997. And after that point, it was sort of malaria all the way, whether it was wet lab malaria stuff uh, or in the background doing, you know, kind of blending that into epidemiology. So I've had the opportunity to work on vaccine development, which we still do drug development, which I did in my PhD, uh, and then diagnostics. And, you know, we'll be talking about diagnostics today. Great. So you're, you were born and raised in Iowa, is that correct? 
No, I was born in Chicago, and then we <laughs> lived in uh, Chicago. I lived in Middletown, New Jersey, not too far for you know those of you in the New York mm-hmm. area. Then I, I went was. to high school in uh, in Iowa, and when my family moved on to Arizona and then China, I stayed in Iowa and um, went to college in Iowa, and uh, so I have a lot of Midwestern roots, but uh, very happy to be out here in Seattle, Washington now for for a Great. long time. So let's talk about your paper, um, Lancet, Lancet Microbe, uh, assessing the daily natural history of asymptomatic plasmodium infections in adults and older children in Katakwi, Uganda, a longitudinal cohort study. Uh, did I pronounce that right? Yeah. Katakwi. Um, let's... For, tell us what was the driving question behind this study? Sure. So we often talk about, you know, diagnostic tests and the way we talk about horsepower in cars, we talk about like the limit of detection of the test. There's like a lot of parameters you, that make a test good, but the one that's the most sexy that everybody talks about is the limit of detection. And blood smears, which have been used for more than a hundred years, aren't very sensitive but they're sensitive enough that like someone who's very sick in the throes of malarial illness will be blood smear positive. And we've used that for a long time to decide who to treat and if they're getting better. Um, but those people who are obviously sick with malaria, especially in endemic areas, are just the tip of the iceberg. And as you go deeper into the water, you run into tests that are increasingly unable to detect the, like, the murky bottom of the iceberg, so to speak. And so when we started doing this work, we were trying to develop super sensitive molecular tests so that we could do human challenge studies. And we, we do human challenge studies in Seattle. You know, we give people a vaccine or a candidate drug. And then sometime later, we either give them mosquito bites with infectious P. P falciparum parasites, or now we can give it with a needle in the vein. And in any case, we have to follow those patients for safety, amongst other things, very intensely, and then treat them if they were not protected by the vaccine or if they were the placebo controls who were by, you know, intended to get infected. And so when I was a resident, we started making molecular tests here on the basis of this 18S ribosomal RNA. Um, and the reason we picked that is that in the 80s, Tom McCutcheon and Andy Waters and others, you know, they studied the ribosomal RNAs of plasmodium to understand how the parasite shifted through the different parts of its life cycle. And so it turns out it makes thousands of specific ribosomal copies in certain parts of either the blood stage or the sexual stage of the parasite. And after that was studied, the field shifted to use PCR for diagnostics. So instead of leveraging the abundant ribosomal and RNA, they went to the DNA that encodes it. And so when we started doing this work, what we found was that if you use DNA, where there's only a couple copies, you could make a sensitive test, but we knew we could make it more sensitive if we just took advantage of the fact that the parasite had already amplified the RNA by virtue of its own biology. And so we started doing these reverse transcription PCRs. It works really well because it turns out, unlike messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA is actually quite stable. You know, it doesn't just disappear and and degrade because you looked at it funny. Um, (laughs) I remember that from my lab days. Yeah, yeah. And so that I think that that fear might have kept people away for a while. But what we have ultimately achieved in our human challenge studies is that with 50 microliters of blood, we can find a single parasite in that 50 microliters. And there's millions of red cells in there. Um, Sean, sorry, can I interrupt? See, for comparison, how how, how many would you detect with with microscopy, for example, or an RDT, just for comparison? Yeah, that's a great question. So people, when you talk about RDTs and blood smears, all the literature going back expresses everything in units of parasites per microliter. So blood smears, um, if you read Lynn Garcia's stuff, it'll say blood smears have sensitivity as a thick smear, most sensitive version, of 5 to 20 parasites per microliter. So that's 
5,000 to 20,000 per milliliter, because I'm only going to talk about milliliters. Um, so our test can detect 20 parasites per milliliter as compared to 5,000 or more. And with blood smears, the, the actual use is not as good as what I just stated. It might be 100,000 parasites per mil. And RDTs are in that similar range. You know, there was a whole body of work led by WHO and others to improve the quality of RDTs. And like one of the benchmark numbers was would be 200,000 parasites per milliliter made it made for a good RDT. And there's these ones you may have heard of called ultra sensitive. They're trying to get to one per microliter or a thousand per mil. So we're way past that. And what it turns out is that the sensitivity of these tests are all driven by the volume of blood that you test. So like for a field study, we picked 50 microliters because 50 microliters is what you can fit on a blood spot. And you may have, you know, you've seen blood spots like babies get them and they do them in field studies. Oftentimes when people do blood spots, like in, um, in the state labs that do neonatal testing, they just take a tiny little ditzel out of the center of the blood spot, like a millimeter or three millimeters. But if you cut the whole spot, it's about 50 microliters. And so we started doing that a long time ago. It turns out like the RNA is really well preserved on blood spots. It can stay at room temperature, which obviates all that like minus 80 dry ice shipping from halfway around the world. Um, and we have def we've come up with ways to pool the samples, you know, like we, we do. We would do pooling in a study where we didn't expect a lot of people to have malaria and we would never do pooling in a place where every other person has malaria. Right. And so. Um, as we build these tests that are more and more sensitive, you know, we ask how many people are out there in the world who have parasites um, and how well do we understand their infections? How well do we understand the natural history of malaria out there in the field if the tools we've been using are relatively insensitive? Because there's like dozens of malaria papers that will take a single point in time and they'll do blood smears, RDTs, and somebody's PCR and the PCR maybe isn't as sensitive as these. And the, the trend is usually we found more infections by molecular methods than we did by the old tried and true methods. And when you look at across the literature, nobody has really done at the most sensitive uh, level this kind of work. And so we knew we needed to do this. This paper is actually uh, the second part of two publications. The first publication and the way we got the study funded was to say, was it feasible to do this, this mm -hmm. field study? Because what the field study is, and we can get into the data in the Lancet micro paper, was we wanted to have people collect blood spots at home every day for a month. And they would come to the clinic once a week. We thought it was too cumbersome to have them come every day for a month be they we would have a lot of dropouts so we had them come every day every week and uh, every week we gave them new blood spot cards and if they needed a little guidance or encouragement or retraining um, then we could have them improve their collection technique etc at the end of the month we had 28 spots for every person and then we shipped those to seattle uh, and so the first feasibility question was like would people be willing to do this did it hurt too much mm -hmm. you know would they drop out so we did it in a, about 100 adults and about 30 children who were eight years old or older, and we had really high retention rates. I, I can't quote you exactly what it was. It was like 92 or so percent, I think, um, in the study. And most of the people in the study collected most of the spots across the whole month. Of course, there were missing spots, and you know there were some spots that were not uh, high quality, but on the whole, for almost all the spots, like our internal controls, which were actually human messenger RNA, were intact. Mm. And that's after they collected them, stored them in their home for a week, you know, brought them to the clinic, stored them there for months, shipped us mm. all of them, and we processed them. So it gives me great hope that, you know, not only ribosomal RNAs could be collected this way, but some level of messenger RNA could be could be used. And then what we did was we, you know, we didn't know just because it's feasible and we got good blood and everybody complied, we don't know if the year we did it in, we're going to have a lot of malaria infections, right? But we had almost mm -hmm. half the group, almost half the group, you know, had parasites. Mm -hmm. And so at, at least some point in their, their time, and what's really clear from the study 
um, is if you take a single point in time, you don't have nearly enough information to say anything about the natural history of malaria over that time. If we could have taken even more days, or more months, you know, we would see even more granularity. And so I don't know if, is there, how do you want to go about talking about the Lancet micro paper? Um, For, I want to know first um, the logistics of this. Did, did you have connections there? How did you set it up? So this is a really great story. We we started working with um, uh, with a guy Tom Egwong uh, at the center there in Uganda, and one of the people in his group, uh, Tony Owala, uh, was designated as the you know the study lead and the field lead to to go and work with the community and you know get buy in from the community. But all of this happened in the context of COVID. So, you know, usually <laughs> for a field study, this was an NIH sponsored field study. Usually we would have gone to Uganda, um, myself, and th this was led on the, on the University of Washington side by Diana Hergott, who was a epidemiology PhD candidate at the time and now um, has graduated and fortunately still works with us. Um, so the, you know, it would have been that we would go there, we would develop the protocols remotely, and then we'd go there and, you know, do a walkthrough and all that. But none of that was an option. And so I have to give, uh, you know, a lot of credit to both uh, Diana and Tony, because they developed this great rapport to um, put a whole suite of protocols together and then and then to pull off the study. And, you know, recruiting with under the you know, you remember all the COVID restrictions and, you know, mm -hmm. doing all of that. It added complexity to the clinical, to the protocol. Um, but we got all through that. And then Tony, uh, he, he was really a champion in Uganda to take this forward. And one of the really great outcomes of that on a personal level is that Tony also wanted to go to grad school. And so uh, over a couple years of rounds of application and refining his application story, and he, he published you know, a paper and was on some of these papers, um, he got into the University of Washington and is now um, in his first year as a pathobiology graduate student here at the UW and is just doing really, really wonderfully. Cool. So that, that was a great outcome. So you didn't, you didn't end up going at all yourself then, right? No, I haven't been. We, uh, have some new in the next phase of funding for this work under a separate funding uh, under separate funding. We are continuing to like grow the network that we work with. So we call our lab here at the University of Washington. I'm going to lapse into calling us UW, you know, because that's what people <laughs> say. Uh, we call ourselves the Malaria Molecular Diagnostic Lab or MMDL. And um, one of the things we're working to do is to, you know, share and transfer technology to other groups so that we can run the same assay. There's a lot of value in a network running the same exact assay. And so we're going to do that with some partners in Uganda and in um, Kenya. And so I hope to visit this site where we did this study and keep that going as well. So Sean, how did you select the site to begin with? We had been working with Tom Egwong, who's the head of the group. And um, had had a really, you know, really good rapport. We'd done some sort of proof of concept studies in in a variety of diagnostic settings, and and then we put in a joint R twenty one NIH R twenty one grant together, um, and and we got it. Uh, I think it might have taken like most NIH grants two rounds to get there, mm -hmm. but uh, so there's a you know all those NIH grants. There's a lot of patience. Uh, involved in developing that. One of the reasons you'd pick that site is that it's, you know, hyper endemic for malaria right. if you want it. So in terms of like feasibility, you want to go to a place where there's a lot of malaria. When we did the collections, our idea was that we would pool the samples, but we would pool them within a person. So we we got these 28 samples here, but we we tested each person in three pools. And we know our test is sensitive enough that if a pool of 10 was negative, then all 10 were negative. And so that way we could test three samples and say a month's worth of a patient sample were negative. 
And that's a, I think it's a good strategy for a place that has a lot of malaria, because if you're deconvoluting the positives, you're getting all the info for that person. If it was a mix of people, it would be really quite a problem because you'd have to go find the like before and after from other pools. We're going to, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but <laughs> the next phase of work here is to take this strategy to a totally different malaria endemic region, which is in South Africa, which is nearing elimination. And the question there is, if the expectation is that almost no one has malaria, mm. what happens if we test every week for mm. 36 weeks in this case? So we, we like, one of the outcomes of the study was like, every day might be more than we need. Every week, there's some trade-offs, but if we go every week and go for a whole malaria season, and we don't think there will be many positives, now we can just pool randomly uh, because, you know. Sean, I want to take you back to the study design because you mentioned in your paper that um, you were recruiting participants through community engagement meetings and mobilization. And I just wanted to kind of maybe get a little bit of a flavor of, you know, what that ha entailed and, you know, what, what kind of communications you gave and how did, yeah. you, how did you explain that in the communities? Well, I, I, of course, didn't participate in these in person, so I almost wish I had Tony here with me. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you go and you, we, we develop these communication tools with the communities. They have to be translated into the local language. And then we talk about, this is a little different than a clinical trial, right? This study was not like an intervention mm. trial with randomization. And so the risks in this trial are really that you're going to get your finger pricked repeatedly and it might hurt. And, you know, then you, you describe to the people like, well, what's the worst thing that could happen? I suppose you could get an infection in your finger, right? We didn't see any of those things. So you talk to the community about that. And then the, the reasoning for why, you know, why do we want to do this study? Well, it turns out that in people who are looking and feeling healthy, you might be carrying this parasite and that might contribute to transmission or maybe next month you're going to get sick, but you don't know that. So this is a way for us to learn more about this uh, infection that's local to this community. And so I think that that is really, you know, kind of the story that is shared. Uh, and I think the level of engagement we got, we had good enrollment and good retention. Uh, I think there's a lot of community buy-in for this kind of research there. So the samples are sent to Seattle, and do you do your RT-PCR on them, right? Yeah. So we get the samples. Um, one of the cool tools that we use to process blood spots here is a laser cutter. We probably have the only dried mm -hmm. blood spot laser cutter in the world. And the reason we have that is that um, the reason we have that is that each little parasite is like a little bomb of ribosomal RNA. Mm -hmm. And, you know, someone who's really sick with malaria, they might have 1% or more of their blood cells parasitized, but they might not look that sick. So conceivably, you can get a blood spot and you could process that blood spot and then the next one could be negative. But the, the way that blood spots are processed for like HIV testing is to punch them and then to punch clean paper. And if you punch a, a blood spot with 1% falciparum malaria on it, and then you punch clean paper six times, and then you go test one of your malaria negative blood spots, all of a sudden you have malaria also. And so we very early learned that uh, we basically needed to have no contact type cutting and uh, we do have like a hundred or more pairs of scissors here in the lab, but <laughs> the thing we developed really early on was this awesome laser cutter. I went to uh, the, the guy I bought it from who, who sells laser cutters for all sorts of reasons, like businesses, scrapbookers, et cetera. Um, I went to his garage. This was like ages ago at this point. I went to his garage. We uh, brought some blank blood spot cards and it was clear that like this would work great. We make a little stand and you suspend the blood spot cards over the tubes and then the cutter comes and 
cuts it, it just falls into the tube and there's no way of, of making a uh, carryover a problem. And that we wrote a paper on it, it completely eliminated carryover. And so um, we, we do that and uh, we've gone through several laser cutters. We've broken the hinges off the door of the laser cutter because we've opened and closed it so many times. Um, <laughs> we are we very much wish we could develop an automated one that would just take a stack of cards and then put them in tubes. Um, one of the, you know, the outcomes of studies like the one that we're talking about today is that I think that this kind of testing could play an important role in, in looking at elimination settings in malaria. Because if you have parasites below the limit of detection for almost every assay, and you want to certify that there's no malaria, no parasites there, um, mm. it's a difficult situation. And one way that you could know they're gone is that there's no one with symptoms, but at least in the few years where transmission has just ceased, there could be people who have uh, parasites, but don't present to clinics with any symptoms. So what these tools we're building, we build them for clinical trials, we build them to do epidemiology stuff, but we wonder if they could play a bigger, more scalable role as we hopefully shrink the malaria map with vaccines and drugs and other public health tools. So what, in this study, what was the primary outcome? So the primary outcome of this study was to, you know, look at really the kinetics of infection in individual people. Um, and I think the most important thing for like guiding future study design was to take all the positive people and ask if, if instead of every day, what if we tested every two days, every three days, every seven days, or once a month, how much information do we lose each time we test fewer samples? And so uh, one of the figures in the paper uh, looks at that, uh, at that metric, and you can see that there's, you know, there's trade-offs. There's not a point at which you get no information, um, but testing once a month is clearly less informative than testing uh, you know, than testing every day. And we think that probably a, a reasonable time frame was probably testing once a week. I just want to do a quick interlude here before you carry on, Sean, just for our listeners really to let them know that this is an open access paper. So if you want to uh, maybe download that as you are listening or you want to go back now that you know there's good figures in there, you can do that um, open access. So you do not need to have a subscription to The Lancet. So sorry, I just wanted to say that. No, it's good. Thank you. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. So Sean, tell us some of the findings that you that you made. Yeah. So the you know the the major finding, as I mentioned here, let me just make sure I'm looking at the right thing. Uh, is the last figure in the main paper, but and and I'll I'll give you the the specifics here. Just give me one second. Um, you know that the main finding is in this figure three about proportion of infections detected, and it gets into a lot of like uh, when you start asking if we test every day and then we test less often, you have to have kind of like a rolling window, right? Um, mm -hmm. So. Our statisticians had to say, okay, well, if we started on day two and then waited a week and tested on day eight and then day 15, right? And then you do three and nine and 16, et cetera, and you go through and model all that data. Well, this is the, this figure three is, is what you get. And so if you test once a month, you miss about 30% of the infections. That means that somewhere in that month, somebody had like either an infection that cleared and you tested later and you missed it or you tested at the beginning and later they started an infection. Um, and then as you go back to weekly or you know every third day, every other day, it's really hard to proceduralize things like every other day or every third day. You know, in my mind, it's kind of like once a week, once a month or every day. Those are three options that humans can kind of um, uh, synchronize to once you go every, other day and suddenly it's a Saturday or a Sunday, people get all kind of messed up. Um, so that's the big, that's the biggest takeaway. You know, the other takeaway is the individual infection profiles that are just 
all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. And some of those profiles are shown in figure one. Uh, and I don't know if you're looking at that. Okay. I can walk you through a few of them. And then all of the infection profiles are shown in the supplemental data that if you page through, you know, the major overarching emotion that I have is that, wow, malaria is really complicated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and this, honestly, you know, our test is for a conserved 18S ribosomal RNA. We can see some granularity day to day. We can tell if they have P. falciparum and another species, if the P. falciparum is less abundant than the other species. But we can't tell you about different strains. And we know from you know next gen sequencing data that there are people who have multiple strains and strains are coming and going. So, um, you know, we have been interested in working with some of the groups around the country and the world that are doing that kind of next gen sequencing. Uh, it might be that in the future we send a subset of samples like these to get even more nuanced data about mm. what's happening. You know, like. Why does someone, why are they just simmering along and then all of a sudden it shoots up? Is that shooting up an increase? Is that because a new strain came along while the old strain was just kind of in an immune equilibrium with, with the, the host? But if you look at um, figure one, you know, the first part of figure one, the top um, three are meant to depict kind of like the textbook case of patient has or gets plasmodium falciparum and goes on to develop symptoms. These are three people for whom that was the case. And I think uh, figure 1B, which was a, a female child, is the most textbook case of just a new infection. This is what infections look like when we do a human challenge study in an in a immunologically naive person. They we don't detect any parasites, and then all of a sudden we see this sawtooth appearance of growth. You know, for P. falciparum, the parasites grow in 48-hour life cycles, and the conventional wisdom is that during the second part of that life cycle, they sequester. If you know, on endothelia, and with mm. molecular tools like this, we can often see through that sequestration. So, like for blood smears, oftentimes you get positive, negative, positive, negative, eventually maybe all positive because they have so many parasites. With molecular tools, you see more of a sawtooth pattern instead. And um, the advantage there is we, we ask ourselves a question, which is if we just get one sample in someone who like is clinically sick, we're probably likely to get the right answer without having to take you know multiple samples in someone who's clinically sick because for them, they have so many parasites in there. Um, I'm sorry, I, may, I might have missed this, but uh, when you gave the instructions to the people giving the samples, did you instruct them with regards to the time of day that they took their sample, or was it just random? That's a great question. I think most of them were taken in the morning part of the day, but okay. I don't, I don't recall that we had specific requirements. Um, and I don't think that we recorded the time of collection. It's a really good point. Um, we, you know, there's all these trade-offs between how much data you can have people collect and yeah, still no, no, yeah, exactly. willing to participate. Um, so, and I don't know, am I, do you need me to share it on the screen or are we okay talking about No, this about is good. It? This okay. is good. Yeah. So, you know, and then we've got, we've got other, I guess, uh, stories that these infections tell in the rest of figure one. So, you know, if you look at figure one E and figure one F, here's two people who have parasites at the beginning, middle and end of the month. And, mm -hmm. and they don't seem to be going particularly up. They don't seem to be particularly going down. They're just simmering along. Now we can't tell if the parasites are alive or dead with these molecular tests, but usually in someone who has a functioning spleen, the spleen is your malaria filter, they would filter them out. So, you know, in the absence of uh, being asplenic functionally or surgically, these are probably parasites that are alive. And then we also can't tell whether they are strictly asexual parasites or strictly gametocytes. They're probably a mix of two. And 
especially when there's these dynamic changes, we think they're probably asexuals. What we don't know is like in figure F, we don't know if this is just the gametocyte tail of infection with the gametocytes just doing laps basically endlessly. So, and we have done some testing to look at, you know, gametocytes, um, but you'll see that, you know, when, especially when the samples are not very abundant, the, the tests for gametocytes are not as sensitive as the tests for 18S because we make a lot, you know, the parasite makes a bunch of gametocyte specific mRNAs, but it doesn't make 10,000 copies per parasite the way it does ribosomal RNAs. And so the tools we have to look at mRNA-based targets are not as robust and not as sensitive as 18S. And the same thing's true like for the, um, the drop, for the next-gen sequencing stuff I'm talking about. Sometimes if we ask a lab that does you know, strain typing to do a test on a low-density sample, there might just be too few parasites and not enough nucleic acids to really get much out of that. If you look in further down, um, the, the stories in G, uh, H, and I are very interesting in this figure one because they all depict in blue um, mm -hmm. pre-existing non-falciparum infections that are joined mid-month by a mm -hmm. new P-falciparum infection. And in the case of figure one H, it appears that maybe the non p falciparum infection goes away and is joined by a new PF infection. We, we sequenced all of the, the pure non-PF infections and they're all like either P. ovale subspecies or P. malariae. Uh, we didn't find any P. vivax and of course this was in Uganda so there'd be no P. nolsi. But we don't like, People don't have tools that are this sensitive usually for looking at non-falciparum infections too. And for me, it begs the question, you know, when we go and do vaccine studies or even monoclonal antibody studies, there's a lot of people who are asking, you know, do we need to drug treat people before we give this candidate drug or vaccine or therapeutic? And generally the answer is yes, but we, we don't have a good handle historically on how many non-PF infections were simmering under the water while we gave, you know, candidate drugs mm -hmm. and vaccines? And what does that do to the outcome of the mm -hmm. vaccine and drug study? So we think we need to use these kind of tools at the beginning of a vaccine or drug trial as well to really understand what kind of um, infected or uninfected participant this vaccine is going into. It is actually really striking to see how many of the patients that you show in that figure one do have non non falciparum infections as well as falciparum. Yeah, if you look at like one of the reasons for this might be that the the sensitivity of rapid diagnostic tests for non PF mm -hmm. infections is much less good than for PF, yeah. and so we're already at a disadvantage for those. And when we say the RDT is negative, it doesn't mean that they don't have an infection under the surface. Most of these, you know, one of the things I didn't point out in Figure One is there's these dotted lines that go across, and you'll see there's an arbitrary dotted line for what we think the limit of detection for RDTs is. Mm -hmm. That would be for PF. But many of the stories that are being told on these slides are under the yep. under the bar, and they would all be RDT negative. All these people were RDT negative and asymptomatic at the beginning of the study. Oh, that's a great word that you just used, asymptomatic. I wondered if any time during this study, any of these became symptomatic. The first three at the top of figure one, and those are the only people who became symptomatic in the study. Huh. So... Oh. That, you know, it's really remarkable. And this this kind of thing has been, you know, we're not the, we didn't discover this. This is well known. And in fact, you know, sometimes we say we did this and people say, yeah, of course, everybody knows that that happens, right? But, but <laughs> until you like take a really uh, quantitative tool and describe it, you don't really know. Uh, one of my colleagues, Melissa Kapulu, who's uh, uh, in Kenya, she did a really interesting study. I don't know if she's ever been on TWIP, but this would be a good, um, another good paper to review where they, they did human challenge in people who were semi-immune living in Kenya. And I'll tell you, if, and it was just a human challenge study, no vaccine before, you know, nothing. They weren't testing anything except did the challenge work. 
Well, when we do a challenge on people in Seattle who've never you know, had malaria, they all consistently get infected. And if we didn't do anything to treat them, they would get sick, right? Mm. In the study that in Kenya, they did this challenge and most of the people were afebrile. Many of the people had infections that were so low they could only be detected by the most sensitive tools. They didn't treat them until further along than we would in the US because their baseline immunity mitigated a lot of the symptoms. So, you know, when you use these kind of tools on that, you can see infections that for all other intents and purposes would just completely fly under the radar. You might think the vaccine worked, right? Uh, only to discover yeah. that the, the, the host's immunity that preceded all of that just completely duped you. And the reality for clinical trials is that we probably need to enroll more people in groups to have enough power to see these effects because mm -hmm. some people are going to have all this baseline immunity that makes it hard. So you cannot tell from these profiles who would be symptomatic or not. There's no difference. Well, generally, the rule of thumb is that, you know, symptoms um, go with parasite density. And, I see. Um, you know, if you want to get to like uh, symptomatic, you know, you might have to have a uh, 100,000 parasites per milliliter. Let's call it 100 per microliter, you know, on blood smears. And in Seattle, th those patients would probably uniformly in our studies be symptomatic. But you might have to have 100 times more than that in some patients uh, who are semi-immune. And that the it, I don't, there's not a great way to predict it, right? Um, yeah. You could if you did a, a bevy of, uh, you know, immunology studies on the person, but like coming in the door, there's not like one tool that's a surrogate to, to tell you that. This kind of immunity makes it hard to vaccinate with things that are meant to mimic the parasite, right? Because sometimes yeah. if you have all that immunity, you can like shut down the the uh, the vaccination that for all intents and purposes looks like the parasite. And we see that a lot, right, with um, vaccine studies where a vaccine works pretty well in like the US and Europe, and then it goes to the field and it doesn't work as well. So this, I, I wanna go back to the sawtooth because yeah. <laughs> I mean, it goes from, you know, six log copies to zero basically, right? And so you you said this was sequestration, but I'm really surprised there's nothing left in blood to be able to detect. So these are not, um, yeah, these are not uh, parasites per mil on that. These are copies of copies. Ri ribosomal RNA. So you right. could, you know, a rule of thumb might be to say there's 10,000 copies per parasite. So you can divide these all by, you know, five logs or four, okay. log, four logs rather. But, um, and the reason we did that is because we can convert P. falciparum parasites very faithfully from copies to parasites because in the peripheral blood of a human, you only have the rings and we know yeah. how many copies there are per ring. But the reason we report them, there's two reasons we report them as copies, not parasites. One is we can't do the same math for non p falciparum because there are trophozoites and schizons that circulate. And the other reason we do copies is because um, the FDA really prefers copies to parasites um, because that's how we quantify it. We often right. do. We often do both. But, um, you know, I think it's just a little bit of a um, uh, diverges from like uh, in your virology podcast, for instance, you know, most <laughs> viruses are like one copy, one virus. This is 10,000 copies, one parasite. So um, that's why you get this crisp, crisp drop off. And it's just driven by this like this little packets mm -hmm. of RNA. It gets a little more complicated post treatment. Uh, especially in people who are like asplenic or something. Uh, and sometimes, you know, we don't know in, in post-treatment, sometimes there might be, we're picking up RNA that is in an immune cell that gobbled it up and is in the, in the blood. Um, it's harder to, harder to say, but usually even post-treatment, the parasite signal will go away in about a week. So anything else that uh, you found that, we haven't covered? No, I think, you know, this study is the most satisfying part of this study is to go through the individual patient, uh, you know, the traces of their infection, and then to, to say, yeah. how, do, how do you factor this into future clinical trial design? And I think, you know, the, the takeaways, as I mentioned, are uh, 
you have to have some cadence of collection. Once is not enough. Uh, and then you need to maybe enroll more people because uh, if you have people who are infected and you don't know it, um, if, if the like the criteria to start a study is that they have to be uninfected, then you might have to have some people that don't make it all the way through your statistical plan. I think for us, with net, you know, in the next study where we're going to collect 10 times more samples than this in South Africa, the other big takeaway is just how do we manage the workflow for something mm. like this? <laughs> yeah. it, we have to we have to come up with the way we even the way we label the blood spots so that when we send them home with people, it's obvious where the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or this week, next week, the following week, where those are. Um, so that because you know, in the lab medicine part of me, we go go, we do all this extensive training, et cetera. Well, the thing that is the most important is like, do you have the right patient and the right mm -hmm. sample identifiers? All the other stuff doesn't matter if you don't have that. So we spend a lot of time doing the boring but important parts uh there. And then once we get them all back, we're trying to figure out how to use like liquid handlers and some robots and stuff to to move through what will be like 20 or 30,000 samples. Um, <laughs> and that'll start probably in 2025. Right. You'll need sure. more than one laser cutter for that. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have to. That's, that's a lot of graduate students. Um, You're going to need a bigger laser cutter, it sounds yeah. like. That's right. Exactly. So getting back to the data that you've presented here in figure one, which is, of course, that'll keep me up all night tonight, wanting to know why are there so much variation among eight, the, the, how many, you've got 16 people here shown. How, why is there so much variation when everybody apparently are the in infection during the height of the transmission cycle, process the organisms? Um, how much blood would you have to take from each patient that or person? These are not patients. These are not sick people, right? Right. How much blood do you think you would have to take to get 100% positivity every time well you know the, <laughs> our, our test can detect one parasite on a blood spot right we've right. done other studies where we can detect in some patients one parasite in the milliliter of blood and that means we'd have to test 20 blood spots so we know those infections exist um and in the people who, you know, you see the infection go up and come down, we presume those would be like on the shoulder at the beginning and end of, of that kind sure, of sure. story. Uh, you could keep testing blood, but, you know, we don't really know what, is there a point at which the bottom falls out and, and there's just zero? Like if there's a person with one parasite going around their multiple liter blood volume, we're never going to find that. But the reality is a mosquito is never going to find that either. Right. That's true. Um, so, so the, yeah. The big question, though, in the back of my small question was uh, you've got a vaccine, and the vaccine gets applied to a large region, let's say, of Africa. And now you want to really know if it actually worked or not. I mean, really. And they don't, they're not going to get sick afterwards, no matter right. whether they're infected or not. They'll be protected from disease. <laughs> How do you evaluate? the effect, efficaciousness of a vaccine and then do a, um, a prevalence in it and, 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 and uh, incident study. The prevalence and incident studies that are now ex in existence do not match with anything you've just shown here. Yeah. You yeah, are an outlier. <laughs> yeah. No, you're an out teller the truther. <laughs> I didn't mean it to sound like that. The, um, you, you've got to figure this data into a practical approach to finding out how much malaria there is in a given area, right? And this yeah. tells you that it's all over the place. Maybe everybody has malaria. I've heard hmm. people say that. Jim Jensen says that. He says everybody's infected. Just assume it. But maybe the important yeah. thing is how many people are sick. These are not sick people. They're just yeah, these the are not sick people, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they've got the parasites, but they're not sick mm. because of their immune system's uh, memory from all these past infections, right? Also, you know, we probably have to think about... On... Sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I was thinking you probably, because they have quite low parasite loads. So, you know, you'd also maybe have to think about transmission. 
from those patients. It, this may actually know, as you said earlier, the mosquito can't find it either. So how do you have to take that. How, sure. How do you certify an area free of malaria, though? That's what yep. I'm trying to say. The yeah, vaccine works good. perfect. I wanted this to be zero malaria, and <laughs> you have to really dig so, deep. Yeah, that, you know, like the WHO has a whole process, of course, for like certifying places free of malaria, and I'm not an expert on it, but, uh, you know, a lot of it relies on uh, prospective surveillance in one form or another, course, and also like the, the, you know, what kind of clinical cases are coming through the Hospital door. Hospital admissions, that's right. One of, the, one of the foundational parts of that approach is that as malaria transmission declines in an area, so too does recurrent exposures that drive immunity. And with time, the immunity that we see in this study will be right. That's right. So, That's right. But, you know, one of the things I wonder about is as we make better tools, you know, we could, let's say we deploy a really great tool and this year and next year are completely different in a place, right? Um, last year, we had a ton of malaria. This year, we deployed the tool and gosh, it worked so well. You know, we're not chipping away at the at the burden. We're decimating the malaria. I think under those circumstances, we may have a few years where we need really sensitive tools to say that the parasites are actually gone because people will retain their immunity for a few years, but exactly. they're not going to they're not going to have this exquisite immunity forever. I think you know, Dixon, to your question about what is the sample, how do you proceduralize it? I don't think that getting a mill of blood on a really frequent basis is all that practical for large scale studies yeah, like, because yeah. when you get liquid blood, you have to preserve it, That's freeze right. it, and That's manage right. all that. So I think 50 microliter blood spots are actually kind of right in the sweet spot for this kind of testing. Oh, I agree. And, um, and then even by doing the reverse transcription part, you you get that much more you know bang for your buck out of the sample than mm. you do if you did PCR. And so increasingly, I've seen other labs adopt reverse transcription or other RNA focused methods over time. But when we started, we were like the, the outlier, and we did it really first for Plasmodium. We also did it for Babesia. There's a you know both both now have um, take those have been used in different ways. Um, so I think by leveraging the biological amplification of the 18S by the parasite itself and then the, the stability on blood spots, that's a pretty good sample. But you have to like plan the study such that you get enough samples from the same person to know mm -hmm. for sure that mm -hmm. you know nothing happened in the in the interim. I don't think everyone has an infection at all times. So mm -hmm. you getting a bigger sample in someone who was negative. Um, might help sometimes, but I don't think that would solve the question. I think getting more frequent samples would solve the question in a in a better way. So you've got three transmission zones, right? All it's always transmitted, it's intermittently transmitted, and it's seasonally transmitted. The seasonal transmission would be the the place to go with this, I think, to go you know a little bit for each season, and see what happens to the epidemiology of this over a year. So does this disappear and these are new infections or are these retained all the way through and starting the new infection basically for the next year, you need some infected people? Well, that's what we're um, aiming to do in our in our next study. That That's very much the question, the area that we're going to, you know, in, in some of the areas that are not hyper endemic, you get imported malaria. And the question right. is, is there also like a malaria there? And um and we're going to try to help figure that out with these kind of tools. One of the things, though, that, um, gosh, what was I going to say? Oh, uh, to the question of, you know, how many gametocytes are there and are they not transmittable at that time? You know, I think what our data shows is, yeah, they might not be on whatever Monday, but the following Monday, you could have a thousand <laughs> times more parasites, right? And sure. so if you do a cross-sectional study uh, on the wrong Monday, you think they're not transmissible, but wait a week and it might be a different story. You think a lot of this variation also is due to the fact that falciparum reproduces in the capillaries or pre-sinusoidal capillaries or the pre-capillary venules, uh, and they don't come out into the tissue until there's a lot of them, and then they spill over into the blood? Um, yeah, I mean, I think for the most part, we... Uh, 
you know, when we were talking about sequestration, we see parasites in the blood um, through the highs and the low part of that. Um, we, in only in those ones that are the most synchronous, do we see the like yeah. per perfect sawtooth. And when we do human challenge studies, it's only the first cycle where sometimes we get wobble, um, where we go positive, negative, but then after that, they're all positive, even though the sawtooth continues. Gotcha. So I think, yeah, I think, I mean, falciparum has the biggest sort of Swiss army knife of, uh, you know, <laughs> ways to evade the immune system, redundant ways to infect red cells, et cetera, et cetera. So it's clearly, you know, got the most going for it. And, uh, but these tools usually can see through most of that. Right. All right. That was terrific. Thank you very much. It was that. terrific. Absolutely. It was a great system. I love it. And um, good luck going forward. Uh, that's TWIP240. You can find show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIP. You can send us questions or comments to TWIP at microbe.tv. And as I said, if you enjoy these science programs, please consider supporting us. Go over to microbe.tv slash contribute our guest today from the university of washington sean murphy thanks so much sean thank you very much i had a great time thanks for all your questions thank you sean dixon, that was fab dixon de pommier trichinella.org the living river.org thank you dixon welcome vincent and everybody else a uh, wonderful show great stuff and uh my wheels are turning as we speak <laughs> <laughs> slower than usual but Still turning. <laughs> Christina Nell is at the University of Glasgow. Thank you, Christina. Well, thank you. It was a really interesting discussion, conversation, and a really good paper. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIP and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic. Yes! <laughs>